Hello, cruel, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. You can call me the ominous Shahominus. I am about to psychoanalyze Boris Johnson. So Bojo, he's finally resigned. The stars have aligned, the world has ended, but what are his personality traits and how are they exposed through his leadership? There are five types of narcissist. Which of the five is he? What are the other kind of striking personality traits that he has and how might that be related to psychiatric diagnoses? And what events from his childhood and his circumstances might have led him to become the beast that he is? I will answer all of these questions and many, many more in this video. Sit back, relax, and welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. So Boris Johnson has copped a lot of bad press recently about incompetency, about his lies, but I have to say, I actually find him quite impressive. I find it impressive how totally indifferent he is to other people's criticism and how thick skinned he must be. So how does he do it? How does he ignore all this bad press? What gives him this, this amazing supposed confidence? Let's explore together. Boris Johnson has not showered himself in glory recently. There've been humiliating parliamentary defeats. There's been lots of anger over lockdown breaking parties in Downing Street, and he's also recently been fined. As we all know, Boris Johnson failed to contain the coronavirus in the early days of the pandemic, and this was dubbed one of the most important public health failures in British history. And then very recently, as you'll know, the Tories started quitting, Sajid Javid, Rishi Sunak, they started falling like flies, dropping like Niagara. Today, Boris Johnson finally resigned. So chaotic, unruly, undisciplined, but enough about his hair, what about Boris's actual leadership style? Let's first look at some of his character traits. Let's psychoanalyze him. So I think Boris Johnson has this strong fantasy kind of image, this fantasy world in his head, which is very disconnected from reality. He desperately want, wants to be seen as the savior of this country, just like his hero, Winston Churchill was in World War II. So Boris Johnson wants legendary status. He wants to be like remembered as the prime minister that heroically brought the country through the pandemic and managed to deliver Brexit. What traits am I talking about? Of course, I am talking about narcissism. Pretty obvious, clues in the title, I mentioned it earlier. So what specific features of narcissism does Boris Johnson display? Well, there's self-importance, there's grandiosity, and there's entitlement, the pillars, the bread and butter, the pizza base of any narcissist. On top of all that, he's got this immense lack of shame, this lack of embarrassment, which I think is kind of reflected by the fact he's had so many affairs. Plus, Boris Johnson won't apologize for his failures. He literally ignores them. Only today did he quit after humongous pressure. He literally jumped off the sinking ship at the very last moment. And I think it's one of the first times when he's ever actually admitted defeat. Do you know of any other times that I don't know of? Let me know in the Schmomit Schmection below. But I think all of this is rooted in deep insecurity, which comes from some of his childhood experiences, and we will come back to that later. Before that, just an example of how he refuses to take responsibility. Recently, he's continued to insist that he did not know he was breaking any rules by having parties during the pandemic lockdown. I mean, that's just mind-blowing BS, isn't it? Of course he knew, he literally was part of the committee that made the rules. But what I think is interesting about him is he instinctively blames other people or external factors. He tried to deflect the blame for the Downing Street parties ever since the allegations first came out. Okay, before we move on, I've got a quick quote, which I think really sums up Boris Johnson, and it is this. There are no disasters, only opportunities, and indeed opportunities for fresh disasters. So my psych for sore guys and gals, can you tell me who that quote was by? Here's a clue, it was a hero of Boris Johnson. I'll tell you later on in this episode. So we also know that Boris Johnson has a tendency to break rules. Even before the whole Partygate incident, he refused to sack the Home Secretary, even when she was found to have broken the ministerial code. So what does this mean, this disregard for norms and for rules? Well, as well as narcissism, it reflects another well-known personality disorder. Which one, can you tell me? It is, of course, psychopathy, psychopath. So I'm not formally diagnosing 
Boris Johnson as a psychopath, but I think it's fair to say that he has numerous traits. All of the things I talked about before. So very briefly, there's a test called the psychopathy checklist, and it's got 20 items. And when you're formally diagnosing a psychopath, like I do for my work, you give somebody a score depending on how much of that item they have. If their combined score goes over a threshold, then they're technically a psychopath. And Boris Johnson has many of those character traits that I've talked about, which are in that test. Also a lack of fear, extramarital affairs being promiscuous. So he's, he's got all of these features. Moving on, Johnson is often accused of dishonesty. So why else would somebody make such reckless promises? For example, during the Brexit campaign trail, he said that 350 million pounds per week would go to the NHS after Brexit. Never happened. He didn't just say it, he literally printed it on the side of a bus and went around driving this, well, not driving, but went around with this bus. So narcissists and psychopaths are self-absorbed. They're kind of disconnected from objective criteria of behavior, and they have this strong tendency towards self-deception. So over time, they start believing their own hype, their own lies. Plus, they select information which supports the positive in, uh, images of themselves, and they ignore any negative information. What I'm saying is, they kind of pick and choose their own version of reality. They make reality whatever they want it to be. So in psych speak, if you want to sound cleverer than you actually are, which is basically half of my job as a psychiatrist, this is called cognitive bias. Narcissists and psychopaths are kind of ideal personalities to become leaders. And this is because there's this strong desire for power and dominance, but not just that, there's also this ruthlessness and this ability to manipulate people, to manipulate their means until they obtain powers of uh, positions of power. In fact, it's a well-known fact that psychopaths are overrepresented in CEOs because they're willing to stab other people in the back to get that promotion. Okay, so I mentioned before that there are five types of psychopath, which I stand by, and which one is Boris Johnson? So there's the overt psychopath. The overt psychopath is probably the most common and I think the one that fits, um, that categorizes Boris Johnson the most accurately. So they're entitled, they're kind of overbearing, they're grandiose, they're quite competitive. They're typically a show off. So if you met one of these people in the pub, you would tell straight away that they're a show off. You might feel they're a bit off. They have a lack of empathy. Then there's the covert psychopath, which is, which is somebody who's still entitled, but they prefer to feel sort of victimized. They're very defensive and they always feel wronged. They're always the victim. I don't think Boris really plays that role that much, to be honest with you. Then there are the antagonist kind of um, narcissist who are arrogant. They're always trying to take advantage of people. They're always arguing with people. They're always looking for a fight, um, either verbally or physically. Then there's the communal type of the psychopath. So again, they're still entitled. In fact, they're all entitled, but they kind of make it about they're outraged on behalf of other people. So I would put a lot of social justice warriors into this category. So they get offended on behalf of other people, this person's being sexist, racist, but it's not actually them at the heart of it caring about the people they claim to represent. It's about them having the upper hand. These are exactly the kind of people that I see all the time on Twitter who are outraged about everything. And then finally, there's the malignant type of narcissist who's vindictive, who enjoys the, watching other people squirm, who enjoys putting other people down. Like these are the people that are behind cancel culture. They won't just have an agenda, they'll go out of their way to destroy other people, to cancel other people. And their motivation, like other narcissists might, might um, exploit or screw over other people, but that's just kind of like a side effect. Whereas the malignant psychopath, uh, sorry, the malignant narcissist, that's their full intention. So I think that Boris Johnson, as I said before, is probably an overt. I think he's got some of the other ones, maybe a little bit communal, maybe a little bit malignant. As an example, um, he said some horrible things about Keir Starmer. He tried to say that he should have used his time prosecuting journalists, he used his time <coughs> prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, although it turned out there was no evidence that Starmer had any role in the Jimmy Savile case. That's just one example. I don't think Bojo did that routinely versus somebody like Donald Trumpet, who I think went out of his way to kind of pick on other people and start arguments when, when they didn't agree with him and they wouldn't bow down to him. Okay, let's take it back to the Concrete Streets, Original Beats and Real Live MCs. I'm gonna dissect some of Boris Johnson's early childhood and adolescent experiences, and let's learn together how they shaped his personality. 
So Boris Johnson was born in New York in June 1964 of English, Jewish and Turkish ancestry. He was actually born Alexander Boris de Falafel Johnson, but he always preferred to use the name Boris because let's face it, we can't have a prime minister called Falafel. And if you didn't like that Falafel joke, then maybe you need to get a sense of hummus. Johnson had a very troubled childhood. You might not know this, but he grew up in a house of domestic abuse. Stanley Johnson, his father, had a violent temper at home. And in fact, he even broke the nose of his first wife, who wasn't Boris Johnson's mother, and sent her to hospital. Boris Johnson's mother suffered from severe depression. She had a nervous breakdown. And apparently this suffering played on the mind of young Boris. His father once said, it's a straight, and I quote, it's a strange idea that parents should talk to their children at home. I never read to them or ask them about their homework. I relied on the schools. So why is this all relevant? I think Boris Johnson's mother suffering her depression and a period in and out of mental hospital would have made his upbringing quite chaotic. Poor little falafel probably had very limited affection, support, stability. So I think no matter what you think of him now, you can see why he might have started to feel insecure as a child. He had an emotionally unavailable father and a literally unavailable mother who was in hospital because of her depression. Boris distrusted his unfaithful father and regarded him as a womanizer, perhaps ironic considering what Boris Johnson is like, but then you could say that he maybe was repeating this, this pattern and he learnt from his father to undervalue women. Another interesting fact, until the age of eight, Boris was severely deaf and he had glue ear and he had a painful and prolonged infection, needed several operations. The pain kept him bed bound for extended periods of time. Why is that relevant? Well, there's a theory that his evasiveness, his slipperiness goes back to his childhood. So he couldn't hear when people were talking to him, asking questions, so he would just make up these answers so he wouldn't be embarrassed. And this pattern of not answering questions relevantly could have stuck with him. So as a journalist, as a politician, he would say whatever he wanted to write, whatever he say, he, you know, even if it's not relevant. Having said that, politicians are not renowned for answering questions directly, are they? Okay, so in later life, both of his parents packed Boris off at the age of 11 to Ashdown Prep Boarding School in Sussex in 1975 for two years. And this was in preparation for him to go to Eton College in Windsor. And the prep school apparently did not permit crying. When pupils were crying, they were whoosh, 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 beaten. This is a bit dark what I'm about to tell you, but former pupils of the prep school made allegations of physical and sexual abuse in the 1970s. So in, well, sorry, the abuse occurred in the 1970s, but it came out uh, much more later. So in March 2017, a science teacher from Ashdown House received a 12 year prison sentence for serious sexual assault on a number of boys. Now, I'm not saying that Boris Johnson himself was assaulted, but I'm just saying that it gives this impression that, that he was not in a loving, sort of supportive environment. Maybe he didn't even feel safe himself. And then he attended the notorious Eton School. For those who don't know, for American viewers, it's extremely privileged, seen as possibly one of the, if not the posher school in the UK. George Orwell went there, Ian Fleming went there, David Cameron went there, even Loki went there. And apparently in Eton, his class teachers wrote that Boris Johnson was, and I quote, free of the network of obligation that, and that blames everyone else. So I think these are traits that stuck with Bojo and maybe he was modeling his father's lack of a sense of responsibility. So what I'm saying is no personality is created in a vacuum. Yeah, I think these early experiences influenced who he eventually became. After Eton, Johnson studied at Oxford University, again, for foreign viewers, one of the most privileged um, renowned, famous, poshest universities in the UK, in the world probably, and he joined the notorious Bullingdon Club. So this is a group of 23 students who had an ostentatious lifestyle, lots of boozing, alcohol consumption, uh, they, they did um, really debauch of things like smashing up restaurants. In fact, it's even rumoured that former Prime Minister David Cameron, how do I put this, had an overus, an over amorous relationship with a pig? David, if you're watching, please don't sue me. So why am I mentioning all this? Well, in my opinion, this gave Johnson a, an inflated sense of self-importance. He finally became a person of distinction, possibly for the first time in his life, given his background. And I think he got addicted to that feeling. He got like drunk off that power. Uh, all of this recklessness, this blamelessness, this entitlement, I think it seeped into his pores and became his very being. Moving on, Boris Johnson pursued power to achieve status amongst his peers. 
and I think this fed into his addiction. And he did this through the attention of his rich, influential friends, through the media, through politics. So we're seeing him really blossom into his adult personality traits. He presented himself as quite affable, quite sociable, controversial and ambitious, but he also did whatever it took to, to get public attention. He was even criticised for views that were self-serving interests rather than facts, which brings me on to the next character trait that really stands out for me as a psychiatrist psychoanalyzing Boris Johnson, which is that he became an opportunist. This need for affection, he'd pursued lovers, he'd fathered several children, he was interesting and unable to develop lasting friendships with men, probably due to the distrust in his father, and a lack of consistent support and care from his mother made him copy this misogyny. He moved on from woman to woman. So let's uh, step back a little bit and let's take a look at some of the examples of uh, Boris Johnson's earlier vitriolic and vulgar statements. I think some of this gets lost because there's so many controversies surrounding this man. So let's take it back. So in 1995, he described in an article as a journalist that the children of single mothers as, and I quote, ill-raised, ignorant, aggressive and illegitimate. I mean, that's good alliteration, but it's just a horrible thing to say. It's not a good look. In 2002, Boris Johnson said that colonialism in Africa should never have ended, and he downplayed Britain's role in the slave trade. In 2018, so not even that long ago, he wrote in his column in the Daily Telegraph that is that, and I quote, burqa is oppressive, and that Muslim women who wear the full veil look like letterboxes and bank robbers. Wowzers. Uh, okay, so back to that quote. The quote was, there are no disasters, only opportunities, and indeed opportunities for fresh disasters. As I said, it was a hero of Boris Johnson. Who is the quote from? It is, of course, a trick question. That was Boris Johnson himself. So I suppose the dude telegraphed his intentions, didn't he? You can't, you, uh, can't deny that. One of his biggest uh, controversies was that he proclaims that he had success in handling COVID because he had one of the highest percentages of the population of the UK vaccinated, which is true. But UK deaths from COVID ranked sixth highest in the world's 206 countries. Sixth highest, that's crazy. There's around 200,000 deaths in the UK that were caused in part for people not getting the treatment that they needed. So my psych for sore guys and gals, that was just a very quick summary of some of his controversies and scandals. There are so many more. Any big ones that I missed, please let me know in the Shmomit Shmection below. Okay, so I am a psychiatrist. This is supposed to be psychoanalysis. So I'm going to summarise all his personality traits and psychological patterns. Then I'm going to bring everything together for a fi final psychoanalysis like a pro. And I'm going to tell you about how I think Boris Johnson is very adept at hiding in plain sight. Before I do that, let me introduce you to this channel. As I said before, I'm Dr. Shaham Das. You can call me the ominous Shahamanas. I assess mentally disordered offenders in courts, prisons and psychiatric units. This channel, Psych for Sore Minds, is a smorgasbord of videos related to true crime with a sprinkle of mental illness. If you're interested in these high profile cases, I've done a psychoanalysis on Jelaine Maxwell, excuse me, Jimmy Savile, Tommy Robinson, Amber Heard, her diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, grooming, the Rotherham scandal, all of this kind of stuff. Go chiggity check it out. I just want you to know that I made this channel so that I can give you, dear viewers, professional insights so I can educate you, so you can start to analyze, dissect cases like a professional from both a psychiatric and a legal perspective. I also made this channel to take over the world, but not going so well. I implore you to subscribe, because not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it guarantees that you will never run out of loo roll for the rest of your life, guaranteed, or your money back. Okay, back to Bojo. Let's summarise Boris Johnson. We've already got a picture of what his childhood was like. There was very little love, warmth, affection from his parents. He had emo a, a literally emotionally unavailable father. Uh, sorry, an emotionally unavailable father and a literally unavailable mother who was in and out of hospital. He had glue ear until the age of eight, which might have contributed to his evasiveness. He was privileged. He went to Eton. He went to Oxford. He was seen with the cream of the crop. He rubbed shoulders with the, with the echelons of society, even as an adolescent. In my opinion, this, being in the Bullingdon Club, gave him this inflated sense of self-importance. He saw himself as a person of distinction, possibly for the first time in his life. He was reckless. He was blameless. He was entitled. There was very little... Um, kind of consequences for his action. 
he presented himself as affable, sociable, controversial, and he said what he wanted to for effect to get attention, and he developed this instinct to lie and to blame others first. He's also quite sexually liberal, I think it's fair to say, pursued, uh, pursued lots of lovers, fathered several children. He showed this lack of empathy, and he showed this manipulation, he was grandiose, he was entitled. All of these really posh psychiatric adjectives. So bringing that all together, as I said before, he is definitely a narcissist, barn door textbook. Possibly a psychopath as well. There's a big overlap between narcissists and psychopaths. Psychopaths are more um, manipulative and deceitful than narcissists, which he is. So I think there's a strong argument that he could be exactly that. Okay, before we wrap up, my final thoughts on Boris Johnson and how he hides in plain sight, because I think this is one of the things that makes him quite unique. So Boris Johnson has always been outlandish. He's always been larger than life. He's been dangling in the sky in this wire harness. He's having affairs with buxom American women. He has a number of children. We don't even know how many children he has. Can we just stop and think about that for a second, right? This is a guy who was up until this morning when I recorded this video, was the prime minister of the UK. And we don't know how many children he's got. I mean, I suppose you could make an argument that that's not relevant, like his personal life is irrelevant to his political life. But I mean, come on, you've got, you've got to be able to trust and know the basics about the leader of your country, right? We don't know how many children he's got. Sorry, sorry to stick on that point, it just blows my mind. Anyway, so all of these features I was just talking about makes him very different to your average politician. And I think the public appeared to root for him, to vote for him in the past, not on the basis of his policies, but on the basis of his performance, because he's like a funny character. I think he was at one point, before, just before he got into power, I think he was more like a national mascot. He was more Winston the nodding insurance dog than he was Winston Churchill. Why am I mentioning all of that about this outlandishness? I think, well, I wonder whether this buffoolery, this love of whiff-waff, this kind of tomfoolery, was it an accident or was it all part of a, care, a carefully calibrated performative act? Was it, as I think, the art of distraction played by the clown who's actually the puppet master all along? But the scary thing is, despite all of this, he's still, and you know, telegraphing some of this, not particularly hiding it that well, not even bothering to hide a lot of these character traits, he still gained the most powerful position in politics in the UK. So, ladies and gentlemen, have we learned our lesson or will we let this happen again? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, that's the end of my video. Um, buy my goddamn book. Watch the rest of my videos. There's a whole bunch of them, like, coming on to 200. There's something for everybody on my channel. Go check it out. Stay euthymic and please do not forget, I love you.